give her another round of applause. Okay, I hope everyone enjoyed their lunch. Now we're going to do everything we can to keep you awake. <laughs> no, I'm not going to dance. Yeah, just going to dance. Okay, now we're going to talk about a topic that, although for most of for most people, as you start to get older, this is something you start to think about a little bit more and more, and that's uh, end of life care. Um, hopefully, most of you have taken uh, the steps toward preparing for that time in your life um, with advanced directives and, and or living wills or instructions, and you've given those to someone who are going to make sure that those wishes are, are followed because if you give them to someone who's not quite sure that they like the decisions you've made uh, then that can be a problem but now you're in a position of the person you're caring for who we would hope already has those instructions in place but if not you really encourage you to start to make some some steps toward making that happen now um when we start to look at dementia, obviously the person at the, at the end of their dementia is not going to really be able to make decisions about their end of life care. And maybe even at some point now, even at the beginning stages to moderate stages, they're still not going to be able to make those decisions. Hopefully someone had those decisions or those discussions early on. Uh, but for some people, having dementia is actually one of the most uh, feared Fear illnesses even more than any other terminal illnesses. Not that anybody wants to have any of them, but we know now that it's one in eight, uh, which is, you know, it, it's, uh, those numbers are staggering when you consider um, our population aging and the demographics of aging as we move on and sustain along in our lives. So with dementia, we know there's progressive decline. There is really, I like this word, because I think it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that really exemplifies what happens in the life, and that's destruction to some extent. Now, it's not a very positive word, uh, but I think it's a word that's important to begin to discuss and, and talk about in regards to what happens to someone's life who experiences that, and all that kind of be, begins to fall apart around them. And our goal is to be able to kind of help, to help fix that person's life in a way or adjust their life in a way where it doesn't appear to be destruction any longer. Um, also, what I think is important here is self-identity is at stake. That person loses their self-identity, uh, their ability to be able to be who they were uh, and all the things that made them who they were are now dissipating or their life. So how do we ensure that those who forget will be treated with dignity? And that is, of course, having plans in place. Now, just, off, just a quick little survey. How many of you have those plans in place and then write? That's probably not even half of the room. That's low. And that's usually how it is when I ask that question. But why don't we have those plans in place? It's not a happy thing to do. It's much more fun to do something else. But if we have plans for our life, part of living is at the end that then it will be over. Now, in some ways, that's not necessarily a, na a sad thing because would you want would you want the whole world? What if we all could live forever? What would happen to our world if we all could live forever? For well, one thing, I'd get tired. I mean, can you imagine like Noah was like 185 when he did the boat? I'm like, gosh, how long can Noah live? He's like, nah, I'm 170, you want me to make a boat? I mean, you, you think about that. I'd be like, oh, no, no I'm busy. <laughs> I really wouldn't say that. <laughs> Depending on the right person to ask you. If you think about living forever, which we're not. So you, the way that you plan for your life, some people don't make plans. I mean, some of you just like to live off the cuff, you live on the edge. You know, you just wait for things to happen, then you do stuff. What's the problem with that? First of all, that's fun. It's part of your life. You should, not everybody needs to have a schedule. 
You don't have to have a policy procedure manual with your daily life. <laughs> Hopefully you don't. But you know, most of us, you know, we we need to have some plans in place. So it's important to plan for that end of life care and to start having those discussions with your family members. If you have adult children, um, and just take a look at your children now. Do you want them figuring it out? I wouldn't. Don't you want to figure it out yourself? That burden is a strong burden to put on somebody who's greedy. And why not just make it easy for them? Have it all laid out. Have it all laid out what your wishes are. Another thing my students said in my aging class, they said, I, I mean, I don't think you need to have, to me, she said it's most obvious what you should do to a person at end of life when they're 88 or older. I said, 88? Where'd you get that number 88? She goes, well, they don't really have anything else left to do. <laughs> oh my God! See, this is the people we're going to think that are going to take care of us later. This little twenty-one-year-old keeps saying this stuff all the time. I don't want her making decisions for me. Oh, whatever, throw her over the bridge. She's eighty-eight. Put her, take her to the pier, throw her off in the ocean. Just end it right there. Take her to the bed. You know, the saying, not a saying, I guess I should say, but one of the Ten Commandments, for those of you who believe in the Ten Commandments, is honor thy mother and thy father. Of course, we have to think about when that was written. It's easier 200 years ago because people just lived to be, you know, unless you were taking, can you imagine being Noah's adult child? Like, oh my gosh, when is this guy going to go? <laughs> the people technically didn't live very long. We, we just didn't really have all this in mind. And so people still try to honor this and believe in this. And at times it's not the easiest things to do. And you have to give yourself permission to be okay with being upset or frustrated about how your life has turned out. Taking care of your parents, you need to give yourself permission to not be okay with it and to feel bad sometimes. So those are the first things that we have to start to do. But we also have to take, take into account that honoring what their wishes may or may not have been and, and more than likely have, have hopefully had these discussions. So the first thing we have to do is to kind of overcome this stigma of, of, of having dementia. Um, how are we going to be around someone with dementia? When we start to think about end of life, because what we know about dementia and, Al and Alzheimer's disease vascular dementia, whatever type they have, we know it's a progressive illness. What does that mean? Progressively declining illness. They're not going to get better. So what that means is they now have a terminal illness. So we have to include that in our plan of care for that person, planning for their end of life. Whether you're a professional caregiver, someone working in a, in a, in a dementia care unit or working in a long-term care facility, or whether you're caring for someone at home, these things should be in place. The long-term care facilities for a long time already had this down. They've already got the advanced directives and they ask those questions real early in, during the admission and make sure that they get those things in place. But when you have someone with dementia and you wish you could ask them what it is they wanted, because we get to a point when we're caring for someone with dementia where we just feel like it's if they could just take a minute and figure it out and tell us, then I wouldn't have to figure it out for them. Well, why wouldn't we have the, why do you not want to figure it out for them? You know that person, don't you? I'm sure somewhere along the line, some discussion had come up where they said, this is what they wanted. This is what I'd like to have done. Whether it was because someone in the family died, or whether it was a TV show that they saw, whatever the situation was, they've had that discussion. And now people think, well, it's too expensive to get an attorney. Now there's things you can do just to do it online. It doesn't cost anything. You can get it notarized. Now you can videotape it. Daily. I like video. Because even if it's in writing, they're still going to tell you that you did it wrong. But if you have a video, the family members are all going to be in agreement as to what's going on. And that's the other thing, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All the family needs to be involved. What are the ethical issues arising over the progression of the disease? What are kind of some of the ethical decisions you're going to have to make? For one, they don't have capacity to make decisions. They're no longer able to make those decisions and have the judgment that's associated with that. 
So that's the first thing. The other thing is, is to get your family members involved. That could be another ethical decision that has to be made. A lot of people wait until that person's on their deathbed and everybody's arguing about what needs to happen or not happen. And you know as well as I do that that person that lives in Australia who hasn't been down to visit mom in about 42 years is going to come down and tell everybody what needs to happen. How many of you have family members in Australia just like that? <laughs> well, you know we're going to come down and tell you what needs to happen. I know they don't really live in Australia. I don't even know where Australia is right now. I couldn't even tell you how to get there. But I just know that it's far. But what I, what I do think is that you know those things are going to happen. And here's the other thing. I was having this conversation with someone earlier. I don't care if you have an estate that's worth $1,000 or $14 billion, people are going to fight over stuff. I don't care if they're fighting over plastic cups from Fiesta from San Antonio, or they're fighting over China. They're going to fight over it. They're going to be afraid that someone's going to get more than them, or the things that they wanted, or mom always promised me, or she said I could have. Now mom has dementia, and mom is like, doesn't really quite know what's happening to tell everybody because mom never wanted to have that conversation. Now, if you're the primary caregiver and the medical power of attorney and the, and the financial power of attorney or you have durable power of attorney, you're going to, that does not mean that you still have the authority to say this is what's going to happen. Did you know that? Until she's declared completely incompetent and maybe has, you are now a legal guardian. But so far, what needs to happen if there's not a legal guardianship, which you really don't want to do, it's, I, I shouldn't say that. We'll talk about it another time. But if you can avoid that at this particular point, what I think is important is that you start to have those discussions with family members. Now, it'll probably end up in arguments, but someone has to figure out something. You ever see those grandchildren, those adult grandchildren who haven't figured out what they're going to do and they're like 38? And all of a sudden, grandma's got dementia, and all of a sudden, he or she wants to become the primary caregiver. I'll come and take care of grandma. Grandma and I were always tight. It's like, where have you been? We haven't seen you in forever. We haven't seen you since you got out of jail. Now <laughs> you want to come and take care of grandma. Or I'll take care of grandma's house while she moves in with you because someone needs to stay at the house. The only reason that person's in that house is because someone gave them the keys to get in. Don't give them the keys. Don't give her the keys. Have a discussion with family. Now, it's still, even if you, you're going to have that one family member who's still not going to be happy. If you give that person the house, the money, the cars, whatever it is that you give them, the storage shed, all the plastic cups in the house, all the soap, all the cleaning supplies, they're still not going to be happy. Don't worry about those people. Those are what I call just ignore them people. Because there are some people who are never going to be happy. But the rest of the people who can kind of have adult conversations, those are the people you need to talk with. They need to understand that mom does not have the capacity to make those decisions. You can try to involve mom a little bit, but mom's not going to be able to talk for very long. Right? So it's important to have those things in place. Not just about end of life care, but what's going to happen with the stuff. Especially if that's not already in place. And figure out a way that it's going to be divided up. Uh, and go from there. We have to remember that there's lack of insight. That's one of the ethical issues. When you get to the advanced stage, stages, the only thing you can really do with that person is really just comfort, what they call comfort care. And, and with palliative care, for pain management, whatever uh, we, you want to call it at that stage of life, of hospice, um, and sometimes behavioral intervention, depending on what's going on with that person. But that's really all you're going to be able to provide. That person is going to be depending on you to provide this for that person, for them. It all has to do with having care and respect for the whole person. This is where it all starts to change. Because, like I was speaking to someone earlier too, I had the privilege of growing up with a grandmother who did not have a fear of death, who had altars in her house the whole time I knew her. 
So when I was young, at four years old, my grandmother, we lived next door to her, and she would pick me up. Her name's Ramona. She would pick me up, come and get me, and take me with her to funerals, because she was like the funeral helper. She was actually in charge. She, the funeral director, I don't even know why he or she was there, because my grandmother was like in charge. She had smelling salt, she had, you know, for, she had candy for the diabetic, she had everything that they needed to get through that funeral. And she would take me with her, and the first time I saw uh, my first uh, deceased body, she, I was scared to death, and she took me up there, and she prayed with me, she, she told me what it was, and what was going on, and from then on, I had like, not had any... I'm more afraid of living people than I am dead people. <laughs> people that are alive can scare me sometimes. So I, that's the thing. I don't have that fear of death. Um, so I'm very open to it. I don't want it to happen anytime soon to me or people I love. But that's part of life. Just as much as bringing in someone into this world in birth, you know how wonderful that can be. That is just a still. Those of you who have been there with someone who has moved on, uh, and, I think that kind of experience can be very wonderful, and depending on where you're at in your life and your own how balanced you are, that can be a wonderful experience. You know, and I, like I tell people, I'd rather go to funerals than weddings. Weddings just go on and on and on. Funerals are just quick. You know, everybody gets out of there, nobody gets hurt. <laughs> okay. And we have to think about paying moral attention and not decide. Who's worthy and unworthy? In other words, if you're caring for someone who maybe was not the best parent or spouse to you in your life, and that happens, what's the reality of that happening? It's very strong, right? We can't decide because they treated us so horribly in our lives the way they did. Maybe you're not the best person to be caring for them at this point in their life. You're, not the, you're going to be the one that's going to be tripping over the cord accident. Oh, so I didn't mean to do that. But that kind of thing. So, that was just a joke. That was a little death and dying joke. What I'm saying is that maybe you can step away from those situations where you're not the best person to be caring for them. Let someone else do it. You have to be okay with doing that. Even being the caregiver, even if they're not dying. Being someone's caregiver who's been abusive to you all your life and now they're even more abusive to you as they have to bench and get older and you're still trying to manage it. It's not the best thing for you emotionally. I tell you what, it's going to kill you. It, it will. It will affect you mentally and physically. It will get to you. So you have to be able to stand up and say, I can't do it. Maybe that parent didn't like you, but they liked everybody else in the family. For some reason, you never got along with that parent. They might have loved you, but they just never got along with you. You have to be okay with being, not the, being the one who's not taking care of that person. Now, sickness or health, whatever all that stuff y'all say in your vows, I don't know. You gotta figure that out. You said it, not me, so. <laughs> that was on you. I helped you. Um, we have to respect those who are experiencing the memory loss, anything on incontinence, physical debilitation. Why are they talking about all of that here? The reason they're bringing it up is because anything that you do for that person, you do it with that respect. No matter what, if you're feeding them, if you're giving them medication, if you're bathing them, no matter what it is, what the experience that you're having with them, that you do it with that respect. A lot of times in caring for older parents, I'm going to tell you, even with the dementia, they're looking for that. Don't talk to me like that. I'm your mother. They are looking for that respect from you, even though they don't even really quite know what it is, but they know when it doesn't happen. They know when it happens, and they know when it doesn't happen. They can't identify it, but they can feel it, they can, they, they can sense it. Well, how do we get into elder abuse? So maybe that's the wrong slide. Actually, no, it's not. I want to talk about that a little bit, because I saw a statistic the other day on the Alzheimer's Association set out some stuff. I think it's like 80% of caregivers are family members. In Texas, 68% of all elder abuse is committed by a family member. 68%. I said family member. I'm a little guilty. I'm just saying that's really high numbers. Now, there are no excuses for it. 
However, you can allow yourself to get to a point of caregiver stress that it happens. Then you have to know that you have to get help. There's no reason to let it get that far. And if it does, you need to step away from the situation immediately and get some help. Um, a significant amount of people with dementia are victims. That could be getting yelled at, pushed around, pinched, squeezing their arms, forcing them to do something they don't want to do, forcefully, physically forcing them to do something they don't want to do. And I don't think there's a person in this room who can't see how that would happen. You know it can happen. You know how easy it is to get to that next level, to get to that next step with people you're caring for. You know how easy it is to get to that step if you had children, <laughs> right? Back in the day when I was growing up, I used to joke with my parents, I said, I couldn't call CPS because, you got, I mean, this was a joke, but couldn't call it because there were like two CPS workers. They were like, oh, who cares? Do whatever you want to do with your kids. <laughs> nobody cared anymore. People were getting whipped to school. They're like, whip them. I don't care. I mean, nobody cared. That's the way it was. Maybe we need to kind of go back to some of that in the school. That's a, that's a back to it. The nuns were still slapping us with rulers so hard. Even the nuns were abusing us and didn't even call it abuse. They just called it like, you know, we're being better Catholics for it. And I, I did. I mean, I used, to, I used to think, man, that, this is a crime. The way that nun would hit, hit us with those rulers. We talked about this earlier, choosing to avoid the condition of aging. And really, it's not... Sometimes even the aging as much as it is that fear of death that people have. At times, those who are cognitively strong, which is those of us who are caregivers, hopefully we're cognitively strong. There's sometimes there's caregivers who are not cognitively strong, may choose to punish the deeply forgetful. Why do we punish sometimes? You know what punish means? I don't mean just necessarily physical assault or punishment, but we punish them. We punish them because we're angry about it. This is not what we had planned for our lives. How many people had it planned? This is what you were going to do at this time of your life. Raise your hand if this is what you thought you'd be doing. None of us. Of course not. None of us really had that plan. There's things that you can do to kind of ease that significantly that I think it's important. And the other thing is, I was talking to this woman, she's already left, but she made a really important point. She's a caregiver, and her mother's already passed back in November. But one thing she said to me, she said, it took me forever to realize that I wasn't the only one who could take care of my mother. And she said, fortunately, I realized that the last two years of my mother's, last three years of my mother's life, she said, and she struggled when they moved her to a memory care unit. She said, but once she got settled in and she got used to all the things that I said, right, the, 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 the schedule, the agenda, um, the professionals who were there, she got used to the people who were working there, she got used to the other residents who were there, probably didn't write every day she had new friends, that kind of thing. She did very well. But for some reason, most of us can't get to that point. Because we made a promise. But I start thinking now, maybe we should start making those promises with a check. Yes, I promise. Where's the check where I can bring people in to help me? I can bring people in to take care where I can go on vacations. I can go away for the weekend. I can have respite. I can have help during the day. Because it's expensive. I found a great website last night for my students. Actually, I spent like a couple of hours off and on throughout the evening looking at it. You can, I, and I, I'll try to, um, I can maybe give it to Jenny or somebody to get you all to look at it. how much it costs 
for long-term care in all the states in the United States, and it's just very scary. Uh, but it talks about some ways in which it can be paid for. Um, but remember, when you decide to put your family member, or if you're thinking about putting your family member into a memory care unit, or a nursing home, or assisted living, whatever the case might be, when you, if you've visited those places, do they just have one person working 24-7? Why not? Why don't they just have one person working 24-7? Well, of course they can't. Why can't they? Burnout or what else? Huh? It's against the law. Can you be a good caregiver if you're doing 24 7? Y'all are doing it. Y'all are doing it. One on one. Can they do it one-on-one -on -one at the nursing home? One-on-one, 24-7, -on -one, one person? Never changing that person? That person staying there 24-7? Why not? Of course not. You know where I'm getting at with this. If it can't be done with professional staff who are trained to take care of those group of people, what makes you think you can do it all the time? We have to get past Whatever that is that's keeping us from being okay with going to the next step. Just like the woman I was speaking when she was still here. When she just said, I realized it was the best thing I had done. Not only for me, but for my mother. She did so much better. Now... To me, this is part of the ethical decision making that you have to do for yourself. That that decision be made. Now, for some people, it's not affordable. For whatever reason, it's not affordable. Not everybody can afford to do this. And everyone can afford to make it happen. This is why you have this, the wa other wagons around you that you can go to to kind of seek that support. But it's part of the decision that you make uh, so that we can avoid these situations in which you have your life has become disrupted to the point that it's destructive and that the person you're caring for's life is so disrupted that it becomes destructive. With things such as resentment, how many of you know that word really well? Exhaustion, how many of you feel that on a regular basis? Limited support, how many of you feel any of those three things? Exhaustion, just that within itself, can create all kinds of, can cause you to deteriorate in all of the ways, both physically, mentally, and emotionally, just to feel exhausted. We don't want to get to a point when we start to think about it ethically, when, the, when we talk about caregiving, but when the giving is done without the care, where all you're doing is giving, and it's almost like a robot. It's just, you're just doing it without even thinking, without even caring for what goes along with it. The other thing that this person told me that reminded me too that I talked about earlier was that she said, the thing that exhausted me the most was the arguing. Just the bantering back and forth. She said, when I finally, I finally, she, my mother didn't stop doing it, but she said, when I finally stopped doing it, my life got better. What are the chances that the arguing, that the person that you're arguing with, the person with dementia, is going to stop arguing? Just like they're going to be here in this room sitting, taking notes, making sure they don't do any things that I said. They're not. It's not going to happen. Someone reminded me to tell the story, before I go on to Ronald Reagan, to tell the story of my mother in the Chinese restaurant. Well, you know this whole thing about old people shouldn't. She didn't think she had to pay. She told me the other day she didn't pay taxes anymore because she's over 65. Well, I mean, yes, she's still paying taxes and doing it her 
taxes, but she doesn't think she's doing My brother's doing four, so she thinks she's not doing them because she's old, but little does she know she's still paying taxes. But this whole thing about money where she was mentioning that her, you know, your mother asked for her to get, get me a greeting card and she'll get one for her and she'll say, she gives her $2. We know that greeting cards aren't $2 anymore. But it probably in her mind, in my mother's mind, somewhere in the back, those greeting cards are still $2. The eggs are still 50 cents a dozen. So they tell you to get them groceries for the week, they give you $10. Because they think $10 is going to give them the groceries for the week that they need. Because that's where they're stuck. And the other thing is for my mother, she, when I invite her, when she stays with me, she loves to go out to eat and what she goes, likes Chinese food a lot. So we always make sure to go to a Chinese restaurant. So I'll tell her, Mom, I'll, I'll get, yeah, I got breakfast yesterday, why don't you get the Chinese food tomorrow for dinner? Okay, sure, sure. I, I went ahead and got her breakfast, we went to this Chinese restaurant. Now she likes fried rice, this particular restaurant charges extra for fried rice, because it's a Thai restaurant, because I don't really like Chinese food, I like Thai food. But we went, then she got her Chinese, she, she had to pay, and I told her, Mom, you're going to have to pay extra for your, China, for your fried rice. Okay, no problem, I'll take it home. Well, I knew that she, by the end of the meal, would forget it, and I didn't keep reminding her of it. So, at the, Which, by the way, whose fault was that? Because I knew that she was not going to remember, and I should have kept reminding her about it. So when the bill came, she had to pay for her meal, plus the $3 extra for the fried rice, which, by the way, is a plate like that big. Okay, it's, worth, it's pretty big. So... She stood up and started yelling at me in the restaurant and saying, I'm never coming to this restaurant again with you, and I'm not paying anything. And she said, here's your, here's your money. Her bill was $14. She gave me 5 She said, this is all I'm paying. I said, Mom, but your bill is 14 or 17 whatever it was. She said, this is all I'm paying. And I said, but she, she took it. She goes, you know what? I'm not paying them. <laughs> while she's standing up in the restaurant now several things are going on in my mind at this point one, bring me some wine <laughs> a lot I'm about to bring me the bottles on that side of the wall over there the second thing is I started this because I knew that she was going to do that now, my sister's solution to the whole thing is, she wasn't there, but her solution is, well, why don't you just wait later and take the money out of her purse? Well, because my mother knows how much money she has in her purse, even though she doesn't know where her earrings are or how to put her blouse on, but she knows where her money, how much money she's got in her purse. She had like 120 in her purse. And I knew that if I took 20 out of there again, she wouldn't have known. Plus, I wouldn't do that. It just feels weird. So... She started arguing and yelling, yelling at me. Well, arguing, I tried to stay off the argument. My niece was with, was with us, and my niece is like a teenager. She's on her phone. She doesn't care. <laughs> you know, whatever, grab was going off again. I'm sure she's writing. So she just said, let's go. She told her, she said, my niece's name is Madeline. She goes, let's go, Madeline. We'll go walk with me in the truck. So she took my mother left me there with the bill and everything. And then when I go, guess who paid? I did. When I go out to the truck, my mother is in the back seat with my niece. She won't sit in the front with me. <laughs> and she tells, before she left, though, the table, she said, I'm never coming back with you to your house anymore. I'm never coming to eat anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. This is it. Then she said, in, in Spanish, she told me, when you invite someone to eat, that means you're paying. <laughs> well, I don't ask her. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying... Come with me to eat. Yes, I'm saying let's go eat, but that doesn't mean I'll go pay every single time. Every single time. So it's really difficult. And she'll even tell me when she gets to my house, uh, take me to the bank so I can get some money so we can go eat. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's going to work really well. Because you're not paying for nothing. Then she'll say, We'll have breakfast at my house, and she'll say, let me do the dishes. No, I'll go, because she does a terrible job in the dishes. And then I'll tell her, you know what, Mom? Why don't you just do those last few coffee cups? Okay, so she'll go wash the coffee cups. Then she tells my brother, all she did was wash dishes all weekend. <laughs> did 
did you make mom wash dishes all weekend? Yes, I did. I did. And she cut my trees down. She trimmed them down. She did my yard. She washed my car. She did all those things. Y'all are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. I said, stop. You're not the only ones. It's, it's bad. And then it goes back to that elder abuse thing. I mean, you're like, you know what? Um... So Ronald Reagan did us a favor because he announced the Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. For a long time, nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody was even talking about it. There was no research money out there. Enough research money. There still isn't enough research money being put forward in finding a cure. He unveiled the secrecy and the shame. How many of you see, have seen this in your families that Alzheimer's disease, is, there's some secrecy and shame attached to it? Is there... Especially when people start feeling the, the memory loss and those kind of things, or start experiencing that, that can be very shameful for people as well. Um, so those with the disease were sort of liberated now, that it just didn't become a disease of, of shame anymore. And hopefully we still have a lot of work to do to remove that stigma. Um, so it brought a lot of empathy and compassion to the disease, which hopefully started to add to support that we needed for caregivers in regards to this. Um, the United States is a culture, as we know, that just despises dependence. In other cultures, that is something that's revered, and once you get to that point, there's going to be someone there to take care of you, The aging is part something that's attached to wisdom, and someone who's lived a long life and who has, has, has really brought a lot and contributed a lot to the world around them, who has made a path for those that came after them. In the United States, that's not how it's looked at. Um, it's, we know, we talked about it, it's a high cost, there's a burden attached to it, and, you know, we have to be in a society where productivity is valued. That if you're not working and giving back to the community, then you're really worthless. Instead of looking at those people that have paved the way for those of us to be able to move forward and move ahead. Now we have people behind us that can't even get, get out of bed. That are full, just constantly doing, you know, I, I think about that because I think about my four students that I have, that I watch them and I think that's really scary to think one day they might be doing something important. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even get them to finish their assignments. <laughs> <coughs> the moral principle versus the economic strength, we're going to talk about that. Who really bears this responsibility? When you look at the moral issue versus the economic restraints that are put upon that person, I think the caregiver that is caring for that person should work something out financially with the family to say, if I'm going to do this, this is what I need. If you can't come over on a regular basis to take care of mom or dad or, for, or your dad for another an out for a couple of hours or a week or a weekend once a month, even a weekend once a month would be great to take them. If you can't do that, then I need cash. Y'all are laughing like, oh, yeah, right. I ain't getting that either. If I can't get them to come and help me take care, you think I'm going to get cash out of them? <laughs> what would they do if you just showed up to their house and dropped them, your, that person off in their porch for the weekend with a suitcase? What are they going to do? They might get mad, but then what? Not if you're gone and stay in a hotel somewhere. I'd be gone. I'd get my two dopamine pictures and put them on the porch. We <laughs> acknowledge the right to have a person to make choices. Obviously, when we start to look at this whole issue of end of life care with an autonomy and making those decisions, have decisions, hold views, take action based on their personal values and beliefs, and we know, you should know what that person's personal values and beliefs, you should have had those discussions to where you can help them make those decisions when it comes to end of life care. Now, you know how there's adult children and they all grow up in the same household, they grew up in the same household, there's like five of them or four of them or three of them, and they're all so different, and they all had different experiences. That's not the way it happened. I don't know what you're talking about. Mom was never like that. Dad was never like that. Mom never said that. Dad never said that. 
So you have to have them to be part of this whole discussion process as well. That's part of what our problem is as caregivers, is that we're not communicating with our adult, with our with our own, our own children or with, adult, with with our our siblings or your adult children. If you're taking care of your spouse, to have these discussions with your adult children. There's we we spend so much time ignoring the getting, talking about the important things. It always used to, it still makes me laugh when someone goes over to someone's house who's a caregiver and they go there to eat. And they don't help clean up. How many of you have experienced that? Or they drop their kids off for you to take care of them. Because, oh, you're here anyway all the time with dad. I just thought I'd drop the kids off. Just drop that off at their house one Saturday see what they do. You have to start being an advocate for yourself and say, I'm not going to do this all by myself. I'm not doing it. What are you going to do? Either give me cash or give me time. That is the only thing that's going to work. Coming over to eat on Saturdays and spending time with mom and leaving is not enough. You have to start saying that. It's... Because they say, well, you're, that's, you're his wife, or you're his or her husband, that you should be doing that. You need to get them involved in the care. And yes, you're going to have the worthless ones. You know who they are. The worthless ones. Who can't figure out, who, who can't figure out how to lick an envelope and, and seal it, put it in the mailbox. They'll do it without the stamp or without the address. They can't figure it out. God forbid that you don't do that for them. So, ignore the worthless ones. But let them know they ain't getting nothing. They can get, you have to try to get that time off them. This is, you are trying to get the care you need for the person you're taking care of, and you can't do it if you're sitting there alone being resentful and mad about it, dark, in your dark living room at night. Wondering why nobody's coming around. It's like my friends tell why why should I come around? If you're not saying anything, tell them they ain't gonna come around. But they see, they see how I am. They see that I'm struggling. They see that all this stuff is going on. Can't they see? Well, no, heck no, not if you don't want to. How many of you could get your kids to clean the room just by wishing it? <laughs> I'm just imagining and wishing and visualizing the room is clean. That's what you're doing with these caregivers. I just imagine them coming in here and saying, let me take mom for the weekend so you can have a break. It ain't gonna happen. It's like winning the lotto. You're gonna have a better chance of winning the lotto than that happening. I just say, or that, or the better chance of the Cowboys winning the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's true. Until, until Jones is gone, it ain't gonna happen. And Romo. Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot one. Oh, thanks for adding that in there. We want to do this beneficence, where it's providing benefits. This is beneficence, this is the definition to persons and contri contribute to their welfare, refers to an action done for the benefit of others. What we're doing is for the, their benefit, the care that we're getting, the end of life care planning that we do, the conversations we're having, all of that is for their benefit. All of that is the ethical responsibility surrounded around caring for that person in end of their end of life with this terminal illness that they have. And you still have those people coming around that are saying, they look fine to me. Mom looks fine. I've never seen them look better. Of course. Did you notice that I was half dead? <laughs> we want to benefit them, their health, their welfare, their comfort, their well-being. And we want to improve in any way, manage their quality of life. We want to act on behalf of those that are vulnerable. Because being in that position of having memory loss and having dementia, they are vulnerable. We want to keep them from getting harmed, having to be harmed, create a safe and supportive environment. Now, part of creating a safe and supportive environment is keeping yourself safe and supportive. 
The safe and supportive environment is not just for the person with dementia, but it's for you too. It's for every single person in this room that's a caregiver. It's also keeping yourself safe and supported. If you don't, if you know how you know how sometimes you're laying in bed at night and you're thinking about all the bad things the people you know in your life are doing or not doing, and you're just assuming that they are not doing these things on purpose to harm you or to make you mad, and that they know that you need help and nobody's doing anything, and they're probably not going to do anything to help you anyway. I guarantee you they're not spending that much time thinking about you. As much time as you're spending thinking about them. And remember what I said, if you're not gonna, if you've tried and you're not gonna get the help from the family, then you need to get the help from other people around you to find that support somehow. What would they do if you just decided, I'm not doing this anymore? What would they do? You think, well, they wouldn't do anything, they don't care. They'll get mad at you, but then what? So what? Why are we so afraid about people getting mad at us? My, you know what my grandma used to say? When I used to tell her that? What are they going to do? Take away your birthday? <laughs> <laughs> she used to say, you can only fit so many things in your purse. Decide what you're going to fit in there, and that belongs to you. Everything else does not belong to you. Everything else belongs to somebody else. Those of you men out there, let's just say, well, but if you want to put more stuff in, you get a purse. <laughs> Can't get any more in your wallet. Um, we need to treat any, we want to treat any, everyone equally. I really like this gentleman wrote this book called The Life Past Reason. And he talks about the issue of dementia, but I'm going to read this to work in it's from page 218. We turn finally to what might be the saddest of the tragedies we have been reviewing. We must consider the autonomy and the best interests of people who suffer from serious and permanent dementia. Even in this book and talking about the philosopher, talking about this because at some point, not having had that conversation with someone's end of life care, when they get to that point, when the end of life care decisions need to be made, and we're trying to help them maintain some level of autonomy. And it's very difficult to do because they're not able to do it. We have to make those decisions for them and do so ethically. He talks about the late stages where medical decisions, what were the medical decisions they expressed prior and to make sure that those continue to be honored. Extend the autonomy with advanced directives and living wills. There's a website I want each of you to go to. I just shared it with some students last night online. And it's called Aging with Dignity, Five Wishes. Now, it's not um, a durable power of attorney uh, or power of attorney, but I know that it's honored by many nursing facilities. And what it is, is just, it, it could be any five wishes you have. It could be, make sure that I have lipstick on. I know that's something you were telling me earlier you wanted to know. <laughs> Make sure that you... I'm joking. I'm just, joking. Uh, just trying to lighten up the load here a little bit. This guy's looking at me like, I can say that. Shut up. Anyway. <laughs> make sure my hair's fixed, cleaned, and washed. You know, make sure that my clothes are clean. It can be some, those five wishes as simple as that. Make sure I always have a cup of coffee in the morning. Even if it doesn't seem like I can drink it, make sure I get some coffee because I've always enjoyed coffee. Whatever the situation might be, what those five wishes are. Because that's, because that's something, I, bet if I asked you to write down five wishes if you were, that you would like to have done. If you couldn't do anything for yourself, what would those things be? I bet everybody in here could come up with them. Because you know what's important to you. I, I like to make sure I have a watch on. I love to wear watches. I gotta have a watch on and a bracelet. You know, so there's two. Shoot, I only got three wishes now. <laughs> I'm sure you could do more than five. I probably have like 87. But um, make sure I'm in a casino. <laughs> Which I'm headed that way, by the way, so I gotta hurry up. Oh, I'm joking. I really am going, but I'm not in a hurry. So. Yeah, yeah, I'll jump in the truck. Come on. Let's go. Oh, there you go. Um, not only, 
learn how not only to do, but to be with that person. You know how sometimes, you ever been in the hospital and the nurse comes in and you're like, he didn't even say anything to me, she didn't even talk to me. They just came in, did their thing, left, checked, and gone. Be with that person. Take kind of that moment to be with them. Um, a lot of times, if, if they're at the end of life and or if they're at a point where they're not able to really communicate anymore, you can still make them feel good about what you're doing for them. It can, now, if you sing and you sing poorly, don't sing. But if there's some music, you, can, you start singing, the next thing you're like, oh, God, please get me out of here quick. Make them quick. You're going to make them wish they were dead. So you can do that kind of thing. But do something for them that maybe is important. Maybe for those that are Catholic, maybe saying the rosary for them or having mass on or maybe something like that to help them feel that comfort because they really do sense it and understand it in that end of life. Um, I had a, a friend a long time ago that passed early and he was very young. He was only 31 when he died. And one of the things that he wanted done that his wife did for me said, when I'm dying, will you make sure and give me a foot massage? Because she really hated giving foot massages. But she, he said, I just love them. And I know that I'll be, he's had a very painful death. But he said, I'll know that I'll find comfort in that. And she said that when he was dying, she gave him a foot massage for a long time. And that she said he actually passed with kind of a weird smile on his face. Like, thank you, because he, he it did, it really comforted him. But, you know, it just whatever works for that person, those are the kind of things you have to think about that are, that are going to kind of bring comfort for you as well, too. Um, and, and think about doing that. Find out what their strengths are and, and still try to bring those forward. Um, sometimes their behavior is not meaningless. We talked a lot about that in the previous, you know, it could mean that they need something. Address the needs of the whole family. Now, can you meet everyone's needs? No, because some people just will never have their needs met. I think even when they get to the pearly gates, they're going to go, no, sorry, God, you can't do it for me. It's not going to happen. I mean, even then, they're going to tell God he can't do it for me. So, um, kind of, um, there, you, to be a caregiver, you have to have a sense of loyalty. There has to be, you feel loyal to that person. Um, you may not like it very much all the time, but you have a sense of loyalty to them. And you really don't want any harm to come to them, even though they make you so mad sometimes. But the other thing is, is kind of this memory-based love. I remember this so significantly with my grandmother when she died. At the end, well, she ended up dying of a horrific death, but the two days before she died, she ended up dying in a fire. But two days before she died, I went to see her. She didn't remember my name, but this is what she would say. When I, whether it was, it used to make my cousins and siblings so mad because she couldn't remember anything about them. But because I was so close to her, when I walked in the room, she said, oh, here comes the girl that just loves me so much. Every single time. And when she was bedridden, and pretty much gone with dementia, she said, oh, she would always say the same thing in Spanish. And I had a, um, she wore um, a pendant with my picture on it. Uh, I don't know who put it there, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can help. I just adored my grandmother. I just loved her so much. But anyway, she, she had that, that pendant on. And so, um, uh, actually, I think that, that she, I just, I just loved her so much, and I always just, even when she was arguing with me and fought with me, I still would just, you know, always end that day with just hugging her and telling her how much I loved her, and I would lay with her in the bed sometimes, and we'd talk about family members. She loved the gossip. So I would make stuff up, you know, oh, I don't like him. And actually, one of her wishes, luckily they came, it came happen for her funeral, was that I got to walk in front of her casket, with all, she said, I want all the men walking behind you. So they carried the casket, she said, but I want you in the front holding my picture. That's the way she wanted it. She wanted to see those men walking by. I don't know why, but I loved every second of it. So it worked out. But, you know, I, I just felt like when she died that I was going to honor those wishes, and I, it made me feel better, and I knew that this is what she wanted. That was my loyalty to her. This is what she wanted to have happen. 
and also to make sure that I visit her grave regularly, which I really haven't put, which is why I think it rained all last week. Um, desire to aid, protect, we talked about that. Also, kind of, you watch your tone of voice. This is really hard to do if you're tired and you're exhausted and they're asking you a million questions. You know, figure out something else that you can do to try to keep that tone. Then remember that kind of memory-based love. Keep it there. Um, small but gratifying needs. Again, it goes back to those five wishes. Earrings, bracelets, keeping their hair washed, their hair combed. For men, a lot of men still like to carry their wallet. You know, women like to hold their purse. Um, I don't know if y'all saw when they had those tornadoes in Oklahoma. I tell this story because I, there was these two old women, two separate stories of these older women who were, who had the rubble in their home. And both stories, I saw it on the news when they were pulling those women out. Two different stories. They both had purses around their neck. They're under all this rubble. They come out with their little bitty, you know, purse. And they're, I'm like, I don't know. I think I'd probably do the same thing. But for some, you know, it could be just making sure that he carries walls in his back pocket, that she's got her purse or knows where her purse is. Those are the things that are important. Wedding rings, which you might be afraid they're going to lose, but they don't remember what their wedding bands look like. But you can go buy a fake one at the dollar store and put one on them so they still have their wedding band on Keep that in mind, too. Don't put their expensive jewelry on. Just don't. But find some jewelry that will work for them. Um, devote time and energy, you know, to them. Sometimes this kind of helps kind of, you know, what picture do we draw in our mind? What expectations do we have? Um, those are the kind of things. You don't want to do anything that's going to result in harm, but think about what it's going to be like at that time, what, how it's going to end, what you want to see happen. You don't know how it's going to happen. I'm not saying that. But in the event that it is a process where they are on their deathbed and you're going to be there and how do you want hospice? Obviously, I hope you would want hospice involved. And you're going to be in a hospice care center. You're going to have them die at home. However you decide that's going to happen. Be in contact with your minister, your priest, or whoever to make sure they're going to be available. What is their process? What do they do? If you know it's important for them, let's say they're Catholic, to have less rights, please always make sure that you have someone there that's, you know, that you have availability to a priest who's going to be able to perform those last rites. That's going to be something very critical and, and significant in that person's life. Um, for those of you who are professional caregivers and work in long-term care facilities, if you're working with, with different ethnic groups who have different beliefs, make sure you understand what those are and that those wishes are going to be granted. Um, not that wishes are going to be granted, but their spiritual needs are going to be met, their religious beliefs and values are going to be met as well. We want to overcome the stigma. Um, people are afraid to be around people with dementia. How many of you recognize that a little bit? That they're uncomfortable, I guess, is maybe more than afraid. Uh, I think that um, in my experiences in working in the Jerry General Psych facility, I, I really enjoy it. I still do. Um, I find it interesting how they still build relationships, even though they don't know where they're at and what time. But they find friends and they hang on to those friends. Uh, they, they, they're, they're, we're all so, we're social creatures. We really are social creatures. And we now some of you might think I'm not a social creature. I like to be left alone, leave on myself. Uh, but most people are social creatures. We have to prepare, we have to have all the things I mentioned, we have to have open discussions. These are some of the things that we talked about. How much time do I have, John? Okay, seven minutes. Um, find meaning and, pur and purpose in that, and, your, and not only the person's life you're caring for, but also your life as well. And also the other thing is to kind of maintain a sense of hope. Whatever way in which you can find that within yourself, whether it's your spiritual beliefs, whatever it is, try to maintain that. Also try to maintain a sense of yourself. What are things that you like to do? What are things that you're, you're not doing anymore because you're a caregiver? Find time to do those things again and to make that a part of your life. Gardening, fishing, shopping, going to garage sales, whatever it might be, going to the casino, find time to do those things for yourself.
Um, and also, the most difficult one, probably of anything that I've mentioned, is to find reconciliation with others. Uh, is to achieve reconciliation with others. <coughs> you have to decide. Am I never going to reconcile with this person again the rest of the life till I die? I will die disliking and hating and being mad or whatever at that person. If you've decided that, you need to make sure that that person knows that too. There's no way to get out of this. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. But if you've not made that decision, then reconcile them. The sooner the better. Because here's the thing. I know in my family, there are people who are mad at people for stuff that happened that don't even know what happened anymore. There are people who are mad at each other for stuff, and it's, it just seems so frivolous at this particular point. It could have been something major that happened that's un that made you believe that it's unforgivable. But that anger, that anger is not good for you. That resentment is not good for you physically, emotionally, or mentally. At some particular point, you're going to have to find... Now, maybe you're not going to become the best of family members ever again, but at least it's resolved and reconciled. It's much more fun to keep blaming that. It's much more fun to be angry with them. I don't know if that's fun, but it's easier, right? The hardest part is to reconcile. And I have this idea, this suggestion that when you decide to reconcile, that you do so without discussion of what happened. Unless that person is living with your ex-husband or ex-wife. That might be a little bit more difficult to reconcile that. You know, like if your husband left you for your sister or something, or your brother or whatever. I mean, you know, you have to not really kind of let that go. But I'm just saying that that reconciliation is going to help you get along, get you moving along pretty far. Forgiveness is a tremendous, tremendous experience for anyone in the world. Um, and you think to yourself, well, I've forgiven them, I just don't talk to them anymore, then, then you haven't forgiven them. Um, don't forget about home hospice care. Uh, make sure that you have those things in plan, in place and plan. Uh, strategies for more aggressive pain management. That's something you can talk to with the, your nurses and doctors in regards to that if that's needed. They'll talk to you about the palliative care and the pain management is associated with that. Um, and what the protocols are for the timely diagnosis and what's going to happen at that moment that that's occurring that that person is what we call actively dying in the active dying process. You can't, you can't wait because if you're in turmoil and stress because of that person actively dying and you're grieving already, it's difficult to make decisions at that point. Why not do it now? Not that you're not stress-free now, but why not do it now? This is probably the best time to start having these discussions. Make, set a date and say, by this date, I'm going to have conversations with everybody in the family about it. That person will have the right to refuse treatment. However, at that particular point, um, and that person who's a designated medical power of attorney will actually have the right to refuse that and also DNR order. But that's why it's important to have it all in place so that it moves along carefully and smoothly so that you don't have those glitches. And the glitches that come up, that's why the professional community of hospice is out there or long-term care or hospital care is there to help you get through that process and move along. Any questions? Comments? I think that's it. Okay, thank you all very much.